So welcome everyone to the February edition of AZ Bio Peers. I hope that uh, everyone had a great Valentine's Day and enjoyed um, celebrating Arizona's 110th birthday yesterday. So as we get kicked off um, on this edition, we are trying to bring in some of our very successful um, and seasoned entrepreneurs on a regular basis to share their journeys. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to John Schufeld, who will um, take you on a little bit of his journey today. And so with that, John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Joan. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for uh, allowing me to speak. I was laughing the other day. I was doing a talk, and about an hour after the talk I was on Zoom, I realized that my shirt was on inside out for the entire talk. So I, I actually looked today. Shirts on right side out. So I've already, I'm basically already winning. So it's a, it's a good day. Um, AZ Bio is a really great group. And so I commend you all for being a part of it and having the foresight to uh, participate in. So strong work on that one. So, okay. So today I'd like to chat with you about four things. That's it. Just, just four things. So a little bit of a background on kind of my journey, my road. Uh, certainly this, the road to selling MeMD, which was a virtual health company to Walmart, uh, a few things I learned about uh, along the way, and that, then maybe a, a bit about telehealth of the future, I guess, at least as I see it. <clears throat> so I titled this talk Road to the Exit. However, you know, one of the most important things I've learned, and I, I relearned this, not quite daily, but often, is that the the fun, the gifts you receive are, are actually on the road. They're, they're not at the exit. Uh, they're actually while you're going along. That's where the fun is. That's where the learning is. That's where the chance to practice all the requisite qualities that you need along the way. It's a chance to show your metal. It's a chance to show what you're made of. Um, there's this quote from Seneca, and it goes, um, no person is more unhappy than he who never faces adversity for he's not permitted to prove himself. And I think that is so, so appropriate for entrepreneurs. Um, and, and I'm sure you're aware there's a quote by Phil Graham, who started Y Combinator, startups are hard. And, and I know many of you out there and who are in your own startups and past the startup phase, but are in the actual day to the operations phase. And as you can attest to, oh, for God's sakes, these are hard. Um, and it's not meant for people who don't have a lot of resilience. It's not meant for people who don't have metal. Uh, when I find myself feeling overwhelmed and I think I'm like, for, for the, what the hell am I thinking? You know, I always think of this quote. One day in retrospect, the years of struggle will strike you as the most beautiful. And for me, it was important to constantly remind myself of this. And you guys know this already as an entrepreneur, there's going to be a lot of struggles, you know, financial struggles. You know, I'll shadow all this in the future in a little bit. But, you know, I had my house triple mortgaged. I was flying a helicopter every day to work. I had to sell the helicopter and make payroll, which forced me to add two hours commute time every day. Um, you have IP and tech issues, uh, if not daily, seeming like like almost every day. Um, we all know that employees can be one of the greatest gifts in the world. They can also be mind numbing where you want to think, what the hell were you thinking? Um, growth or lack thereof, uh, adoption, are people picking up what you're trying to sell? Uh, do they get it in the same way you get it? And finally, these pivot or persevere decisions. Do you just gut it out? Do you fall down seven times and get up eight? Or do you look for the road less traveled and change courses? But, you know, looking back, these were really the years with the most challenging and the most fun. And, and I got to see what I was made of. You know, recently I was driving, it was 3 a.m. It was in the middle of South Dakota in the winter in a snowstorm. I could barely see ahead of me. I was headed to this emergency department and there was this moose. And I was going probably 40 miles an hour. And there was this moose standing in the middle of the road. And we almost became, we almost became one. And I had the moment of like, what the hell are you doing at your age driving, almost hitting a moose in the middle of South? I mean, I would have been screwed because there's nobody out on the road. But I looked back and at the same moment, I said, you know, as dumb as it sounds, this is where the fun is. Not hitting the moose for God's sakes. I'd be, a, you know, the instant vegetarian, but it's where the fun was. And I look back, these are where the stories come from. 
you know, I've been told by folks that MeMD was an overnight success, and I always, I always laugh when I hear that because it's like Ray Kroc said, I was an overnight success, all right, but 30 years and a long night. So my journey, and I'll share that with you momentarily, was only 28 years. Uh, so, you know, I, I have it far easier than Ray is. I'm taking the next two years off. All right. So let's talk about uh, the journey a little bit. All right, so it started with a company called NextCare. NextCare was an urgent care that I started, kind of got the idea in 92 and started in 93. Now, you know, right now you cannot drive down the street without spitting and hitting an urgent care. There are so many of those damn things out there. But in 92, 93, there weren't any. In fact, it was generally unheard of. I, there may have been one in the Midwest, maybe two in the Midwest and maybe on the East Coast, but no one had ever heard of it. The idea came to me, oddly enough, from bees. And I used to work on a bee farm growing up, and I hated those little bastards. And I remember I was working one day, and this guy comes in, this good-looking 30-ish-year-old guy comes in, and his chief complaint was I was almost stung by a bee. And I looked at him, and I said, you were almost stung by a bee? He goes, yeah, the thing almost bit me. And I go, yeah, I mean, I had instant empathy because those things stung me every day. And I said, well, wait a minute. If you're almost stung by a bee, I don't understand why you're why you're here because you weren't actually stung, right? He started talking to me like I was an idiot. He goes, "No, I was almost stung by a bee," and I said, "Well, how can I help you?" And he goes, well, "What what am I going to do if I'm almost stung again?" And I said, "Maybe you should almost come in." And I thought at that time there has got to be a better place for people who are almost stung by a bee. I mean, I went to emergency medicine to take care of sick and dying people who are traumatized and strokes and heart attacks and all these things and i'm not for the almost stung by a bee crowd so i thought maybe there's a better place for them to go that's less expensive that's quicker easier in and out blah 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 urgent care so again you look at it now this was not rocket science but at the time it was a little unusual um i had two partners at the time and one of them bailed out after about two weeks because that's what we opened one at 801 south power road it was called arizona um, um family and urgent care um, no patients came in for about two months. Fortunately, we were near a leisure world. And finally, this, when the snowbirds came but in late November, the place kind of exploded. He was already long gone. And my other partner and I kind of ran it. He finally said to me, look, the, one was great. I don't want to go anywhere past one. This one almost killed me. So you're on your own, Slick. Um, and so I kind of went on to educate the health plans and, and patients. And these were all issues that really helped me you know, kind of pave the way for MeMD. As I mentioned, the initial name was Arizona um, Family and Urgent Care. And so I heard somebody answer the phone one day, thank you for calling Offuck. And I looked at them, I said, <laughs> excuse me? They said, Offuck, Arizona Family and Urgent Care. And I thought, time to change the name. So after a long, arduous process, one day I was super sleep deprived. I'd worked the reverse nights and days. So I was working a reverse 24 in the emergency department. And I said, it's got to be, it's got to be the next name. And I thought, next name, next care, next care. And that was the name of it. So next care was self-funded. We bootstrapped the hell out of it. As I mentioned, the home was triple, my home, our house was triple mortgaged. I was flying back and forth to work in Castle Ground in this helicopter, which I loved. It was like the old Magnum PI helicopter. It was super old, but a lot of fun. Didn't have air conditioning, of course. We flew with the doors off and I had to sell it to make payroll one time. Uh, we factored our receivable, all the things you guys are used to doing, the bootstrap financial company, literally sort of selling myself. I would, and I would have done that had anybody been willing to pay, we pretty much did it all. In about 95, we looked at starting the franchise urgent cares, which had never been done before. Um, urgent cares, no healthcare entity at that point was franchised. I was over in Moscow and I was finishing up this AS, uh, MBA at ASU and and I kind of broke off by myself to go to Moscow because at the time you could fly a, um, a Russian fighter jet uh, if you went over there and paid money. So I did that and I went to this McDonald's over there and the McDonald's was the exact same. It was two story, it was all glass in the front. People dressed up to go, it was beautiful. And I thought, oh, if they can franchise this across around the world, we can franchise urgent cares, healthcare. So I started franchising and we did about six franchises, failed miserably. I picked the wrong franchisees. I was clearly the wrong franchisor. Uh, and so we basically let them go on their way. Some of them remained next care. Some of them had a new name. 
Um, we then expanded to Arizona, or after Arizona, we expanded to Colorado and North Carolina, and then Texas and Georgia. And we grew about one to two clinics a year for about 10 years or so. And I remember we went into Colorado, we had our grand opening, and um, it was funny, we had all these big canvas signs up, and I remember going there, it was, it was really early in the morning, it was dark, it was like around November, December, and this big canvas sign we had was stolen, it was gone. And I, I started driving around looking for this thing because that was the sign to get people there. And there was this poor homeless guy I found wrapped up in our canvas signs. So I'm like, you know what, better, better you than me, bud. So um, he uh, got warm from that and we had, we had no patience. But I remember when I was standing there talking to somebody, he said, so urgent care, do you have to be sicker to come here than you to the emergency department? And I thought, I'm screwed. Because we just, the urgent care as a technique, as a concept, wasn't out there far enough yet. So every time we went into a place, we had to educate the consumers and the health plans. And it was, it was slow going. By 27, we had about 10 investors. It was all friends and families. Uh, and then in 2008, we ran a process uh, with a PE firm. So we got on venture, we got debt capital with uh, Goldman Sachs and venture capital with the private equity fund, uh, about $50 million in total. And the day we closed was a Friday before the late Sunday, early Monday, uh, when Lehman Brothers failed. And I I'd, we'd, I'd talked to the guys the next week, and I said, hey, have, had we waited a week to close, would we have closed? And they said, absolutely not. He said, had you not closed that Friday or before, you would have never closed. So it was a little bit of a blessing and a curse. We closed on February 12th, 2008. And as you guys recall, um, on Monday, October 15th, uh, the world changed. So we, we went through this kind of two-year recession and just scraped and fought the whole time. We had a DOJ complaint uh, around 2010 about testing we were doing, which was PCR testing. Now, no one in the country was doing PCR testing except us in Cleveland Clinic. We just happened to know somebody who was selling these PCR tests. So we were doing PCR tests for H1N1 flu. Now, the irony of all this is today we all talk about, you know, oh, is your COVID test PCR? Well, of course it is. At the time, PCR was unheard of and it was super expensive, it was 600 bucks. We were doing PCR tests on H1N1. So the DOJ said, well, this is inappropriate testing. These tests are $600. And I said, great, game on mothers. We have all the, we have all the data to support us. The board for about six months said, yeah, we'll fight the DOJ. And about six months later, they said, yeah, we're gonna settle with the DOJ. And I said, that's not me. I'm not made of that. I'm, if I'm wrong, I hope to be the first to admit it. And if I'm right, you're going to have to kill me um, uh, to make me back down. Uh, so I took a severance, resigned, and two weeks later started MEMD. So, you know, looking back and again, again, th this is no rocket science. I know many of you out there are doing some really cool rocket science sort of stuff. MEMD was not rocket science, neither was Nextcare. But in my mind, you know, I, I have, I've been having friends call me for years saying, hey, John, can you, I'm not feeling well, can you do this? And I always say, you know, I wonder where people go when they don't have friends who aren't doctors. And I thought half the people that I see in the emergency department, probably two thirds of them in the urgent care don't need to have hands laid on them. Now, obviously a lot of stuff does and a lot of stuff you can't do via telemedicine. I know this is all passe now, but in 2010, it was a little odd. So I thought, what if we did this virtually as before FaceTime? What if we did this virtually, this transparent on the man, low cost, care on the man thing 24 seven, um, the initial idea was to sell to urgent cares because I would go around in the summer, these urgent cares, and I would go around all of them. We had 60 at the time. I would drive around all these different states, these different urgent cares. And in the summer, most of them were slow unless they're in resort towns. And so these guys would be practicing their golf swing on back. I'm like, what am I paying you for? And they'd say, ah, oh, bring some patients and we'll see them. And they were right. So I'm like, all right, game on. So I thought if we could supply patients to them virtually um, from all around the state that they had a license in, then we expand our market presence. This was a no-brainer to me. And when I went out to the urgent cares to sell this, they all said, well, we're gonna cannibalize our market. You know, you're charging, you know, $69, I think it was, and it, that was $49 at that time, or we get like $110 if we were doing it in person. I said, yeah, for about those 12 miles, you're gonna lose, it's about a 12 mile radius about, about as far as urgent care people will travel. So for those 12 miles, you're gonna lose some, you're gonna get some cannibalization where the people will reach out virtually but you'll have the whole state.
I mean, this is going to change the world. You're going to have, you're going to have your name out there. You'll know which markets are going to blah, 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 fell on deaf ears. Now, clearly I'm a crappy salesperson, which was the end of the day, but no urgent cares bought it. So I did what I knew best was go to, you know, basically B to C and we slogged along B to C. I had, I have medical license in about 30 States. And I was the one mostly answering the phone. I'd always laugh and say, you know, I could save someone's life in the emergency department. I'd, you know, still practicing full. I still practice at, at St. Joe's and, you know, kind of full-time emergency medicine, but you could save someone's life in the emergency department. People are like, yeah, whatever. It's like, that's what you're there for. But boy, I tell you what, you treat a woman at 3am with a urinary tract infection, you are like Moses. And every time I would interact with a patient, I'd realize how important this was and what a value we were bringing to patients. And it, again, it just made total sense to me, me alone, because in 2014, we were not seeing a lot of patients. So we changed from B to C to a B to B and then started picking up some traction. Um, back in 2010, 2011, the, the laws weren't really favorable for it. And um, so I went, I met with an attorney and, you know, he basically kind of said, no, this is foolish. You shouldn't do this. This is a knight's errand, blah, blah, blah. And I ignored him and, um, and kind of started out slow, but the laws at the time weren't really favorable. Um, we raised about $6 million through about two and a half rounds, mostly friends and family. We did a series A round in 2011, a B round in 2014. And our competitors, so now they're about mid 14, 15. There were some competitors on the, on the scene. Teladoc raised 400 million. Doctors on demand, you know, Phil, um, Phil Donahue's kid raised 161 million. MD Live, 123 million. Amwell, 554 million. And Heal, 78 million. Heal was later on. Um, so we were really outgunned early, but kept slogging along. Um, we developed a patient mobile app in 2016, a provider mobile app in 2017. We started behavioral health in 2018 and behavioral health was what I, back right when I started this, I thought if anybody needs this, it's behavioral health folks. They may not be able to get out of their house. They may have agoraphobia. They may feel shame to go into a psychiatrist or psychologist's office. This is perfect for behavioral health and God forbid the psychiatrist should not be laying their hands on patients anyway. So this makes total sense. Behavioral health people weren't ready for it, but by 2018, they were. So we started doing psychiatry. We did men's and women's health in 2019. And by 2019, we were seeing about 60,000 patient visits a year. And then 2020, COVID hit, and we were up to about 100,000. Now, as you guys all know, timing is absolutely everything. And our timing on this particular one was, was lucky. Um, COVID accelerated virtual care probably by two to three years and maybe even more maybe infinitely more actually um in 2020 we ran a process sent the deck out to a large number of people a large number of institutions we went through a pretty deep due diligence with four walmart came to the game fairly late uh and they promised they'd catch up now as you can imagine um and i actually could not have imagined at the time that walmart's diligence was exhaustive and extensive they i can't remember they i think they purchased 30 to 40 companies a year and they have it down to a science um one of the things that you have to do and there was a, there was two telecoms i looked at before us and one of them failed the ceo test so apparently the, you have to the ceo of the company they're buying has to talk to walmart's north american ceo this guy named john Fernow, really cool guy um, you know, he's, a, he's kind of a wannabe rock star. He's a pilot. I'm like, oh, I can, I can relate to this guy. And um, we we're talking about scale. And, he, and I asked him about, you know, kind of the scale for me, MD. And he said, John, let me, let me tell you. He said, I'm getting chastised at a board meeting because one of the, per, one of the companies we bought is only doing 60 billion. And I think my mouth dropped open. You know, I mouthed the word billion. He goes, yeah, 60 billion. It's doing 60 billion. And I'm getting kind of beaten up at board meetings. So he goes, so as far as scale goes, we don't do anything small. So I'm like, oh, all right, game on. So diligence lasted about six months and it was really, it continued right up to the end, right? Literally almost to the last day. But I have to say, um, and I, I never doubted that would not happen, but there are plenty of times uh, when it, it got a little bit direct. Um, but I will have to say one thing about Walmart and, you know, I'd probably been in Walmart six times in my entire life before this process. I started going in there a lot more actually. I'll have to say one thing about Walmart. 
and this is from the CEO down. In fact, this is everybody who I've met on their team, and I've met a lot of people. They are honest, bright, and hardworking, and they have a ton of integrity. Uh, they were tough as hell to negotiate with. Um, again, right down to the final detail. But I, there was not a, I cannot think of a negative thing to say about them. They were there, the, the people I'd be friends with, they are solid people. Um, and it's funny, right down to the end, I had one shareholder who um, was a major shareholder who wanted a stock only deal. And I said, you know, the, for the price they're paying, they don't want to do stock, they want to do cash. And I pushed and pushed and pushed, that's what it was. And so literally right to the end, now I was fighting with a, what was once a close friend of mine who insisted on getting stock. And so we had to figure out a way to deal with him. Um, but it was, a, it finally got closed on June 29th. It was a hell of a process, but it was actually looking back again, uh, they were the most beautiful times and, and a lot of fun brought us together, uh, brought our team together and brought us together with Walmart as well. You know, I think as Walmart was, as, as, as MeMD was going through its process, I had three other closes. I had a teleradiology company that I'd started back with in next care days because I couldn't find people to read all the films we were doing it. So I said, well, screw it, I'm just going to do it myself and hired a bunch of radiologists at a medical book publishing company that I sold. And I'd also, um, there was an urgent care company called Doctors Express. You might've seen one. There was one on Camelback and 44th, 40th. And it was a franchise urgent care. And these guys did it right. They, they knew how to, they weren't great at urgent care, but they knew how to franchise. So they had about 60 franchises around the country. And I ended up uh, partnering with a publicly traded company, buying those, turning them around because they were kind of struggling and then selling them. Um, anyway, so if you if I think back, I could never have for, foreseen this prospectively. You guys have probably seen the Steve Jobs Stanford commencement address. He talks about connecting the dots backward, how he dropped out of school, then dropped back in to go to calligraphy class. And because of that, you know, Apple had these great fonts that Microsoft copied. And I saw this quote by Soren Kierkegaard, life can only be understood backwards, but must be lived forwards. You know, I think for many of you, again, who I know, the path you're on now, looking back, it makes a tremendous amount of sense. But you probably could never have gone back and said, yep, I can pre-script my future. I'm going to be exactly here. If you can, more power to you. Um, uh, for me, that wasn't one of, for me, I wasn't, that wasn't me. I'm still trying to figure this out as I go. So what have I learned? That's probably the most, more important things. Um, so you guys have obviously heard of Michelangelo. Uh, he said at 87 and caro amparo means I'm still learning. And, and I try to aspire to emulate that. Not that I could ever emulate Michelangelo by any stretch, but I try to emulate this this mantra of lifelong learning. Um, so here's what I've learned. Uh, you've heard the Peter Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And that aphorism is true. You can have, as you know, the best idea in the world, but if your business lacks the right culture, uh, it won't go anywhere. And as you get bigger, the culture has to be communicated, not only just by you, but now by others who have you inculcated to your culture. And if you don't build it from the get go, from the first person you hire to the second to the third, it's not going to work. And I always think, and you guys know, that you, you know, you can, you, I always try to hire for attitude and not aptitude. I mean, if you got them both, that's awesome. But with the right attitude, you can pretty much teach people what you need them to do. And with the right attitude, they'll do it. Um, you know, the next part is resilience. Steve Jobs said, I'm convinced that about half of what separates the most successful entrepreneurs from the non-successful ones is pure perseverance. Early on in my next year days, uh, uh, the a banker called me and said, hey, we're putting in the workout division. And I thought, this is my naivete, I thought, oh, awesome, I love to work out. And I, you know, laughed and he said, what? And he goes, no, the workout division, we're dropping all healthcare loans, we're out of the healthcare space. And I said, but why? We pay everything on time. He said, yeah, nothing to do with you, but uh, we're, we're putting you in the workout division. And in fact, if you, if you fail to make a payment, if you're late at all, we're going to pull it. And so, Long story short, we found new financing and it was again, slogged it out. Um, and I called this bankrupt who was basically kind of an ass during this whole process and um, just kind of close up with him. And he said, you know, let me tell you something. He said, we could have pulled your loan anytime. He goes, because you, you know, your financials were tenuous and, and they were. He said, the reason we didn't is I never heard defeat in your voice. Had I heard defeat in your voice, 
um, we would have pulled it because I would have known you would have given up. And that really struck me. You know, with me and D for the first three years, we had very few patients. We only had one urgent care that kind of bought the service. And um, it turned out to be the thing that separated me and D from just me throwing my hands and saying, I'm, I'm tapping out to, to what happened with Walmart was, it was purely resilience. Staying paranoid is the next one. Andy Grove said it's important to stay ahead. And I am not, I am the eternal optimist and I'm about as far from a paranoid person as you can get. I think if you work hard, if you're resilient and kind, you'll be successful. But that said, you know, we have meetings every month. You know, I call them red flag meetings and I found this in some book I read. We had them at Next Care, we had them at MeMD and it was how I would beat Next Care, how I beat MeMD. In other words, if we were our competitors, we we're starting this new business and wanted to beat us, what would I do to do this? It's kind of this anti-fragile approach is what can you do to make your business be less fragile, what you can do to survive in, in tumultuous times. And, and you guys have all just lived and are currently living through tumultuous times. Um, picking the right partners and right people, it's of course integral. So how do you know? A um, couple of ways to hire, I do behavioral interviews. And because by, by the time I get to them, I, everybody else has interviewed them and I, I know they're competent. I, mean, I know they can do the job, but I wanna make sure they meet our cultural standards. You want to hire people who you can disagree with, who have skill sets that that are complementary to yours, but not overlap. You know, Henry Ford said, if there's two people in the room that are thinking the same thing, uh, one of you doesn't need to be there. You know, I read another quote um, by Alfred Sloan, uh, the G of GM fame, who said, hey, we all agree. So let's let's stop the meeting right now and come back at a time when, when one of us has the nerve or the temerity to disagree, because if we're all agreeing, we're not we're doing something wrong. You know, when evaluating employees, there's this four quadrant approach and the people in the lower left quadrant are basically poor attitude, poor aptitude. People in the top right quadrant are great attitude, great aptitude. The hard part is what do you do with people who have a great aptitude, but a poor, apt but a poor attitude? And I've come to learn, I'll give them one shot. I will, I will coach them up. I, I metaphorically will put my arm around them, sit on the same side of the table and say, look, I, I'm in your camp. I totally support you, but, but here's where it's not working. And here's where you have to get to, to make it work. And if you can do it, I will be your biggest cheerleader along the way and after. And if you can't do it, you know what, that's okay. But if you can't do it, you can't be here. And every time I've not done it this way, every time I've let people continue, it's every time I always come back to bite me and ultimately to bite them as well, because you're not doing them any favors by keeping them on the team. Next is not, not growing for growth stake. I continually have to talk myself through this. You know, I'm in a business right now where we have, you know, with COVID and all the staffing shortages, we have the chance to just explode. And I keep having to talk myself out of this from just getting big for big sake. You have to, if you're gonna get big, that's great, but you've gotta do it the right way. You've gotta have the infrastructure to do it. And you've gotta have the process to do it. And if you don't, it will eventually kill you. Explore different funding sources. I've I've tried them all. Uh, my experience with PE was not all that not all that great. Um, and what I learned after the fact, I was talking to a guy who was, was the dean of the um, ASU Law School, and I was telling him kind of the story. He said, "Hey, you lasted 18 months." I go, "Yeah, it's only 18 months." He goes, "He goes, he goes the average is he said, the average is 12 months." He said, "I did these deals for years. The average founder lasted 12 months after after private equity joined." And uh, I just kind of looked at him quizzically. I'm like, well, that's not what I, that's not what they told me. He said, well, I'd never tell you that. But he goes, PEs are not founder, VCs, founder friendly, PEs, operator friendly. He said, they're never founder friendly. And that was news to me. So really explore your funding options. There's a lot of opportunities out there now. I recently started a venture capital fund called Accelerant with a gentleman named Chris Yu, who I know many of you know, awesome guy. And it's really, a, a, you know, our intent is to be an incredibly founder friendly, supportive environment. Uh, for budding health tech entrepreneurs. Uh, and finally, timing is critical. I at the end of the day, uh, it's everything. Um, in fact, it must be the most, you know, most, it may be the most critical mon mon moniker of success. Um, I've been way too early on a couple of ventures to survive. I've, I'm generally not late to the game, but I'm often, I'm often early. Uh, with Walmart, timing won the day. They were feeling pressured by Amazon who was putting forth this big telehealth presence. Walmart's great benefit is they've got 5,000 potential clinics around the country. And they're within, I think, 12 minutes of 95% of the U.S. population. 
uh, but Amazon was pressuring them and we were happy to be in the right place at the right time. So quickly a little bit of telehealth of the future. This is no news to folks on this call. Uh, there'll be continued downward pressure on pricing. You know, one of the things we talked to Walmart about was this $20 visit. And if you have a $20 visit, you've got to be doing it in about two to three minutes. Well, how can you do that? Um, AI will win and save the day as James Bates knows, and we're all betting on. Um, there's a continue to be a widespread adoption of telehealth. Uh, AI will absolutely be integral to this process of patient intake data acquisition with some analysis. And we're headed towards more asynchronous care, which is this talk text-based care, which is not uh, done in real time. And then kind of wearables and multi-channels will again, uh, ultimately, ultimately be a mainstay in this data acquisition phase of uh, to make the right diagnosis. So with that, questions? And I'll stop sharing my screen. Did you approach Walmart or they approach you related to this? Did you go to auction? Why or who not? Thanks. Yeah, um, not. We, we, we did run a process. They actually came to us and um, um, we did not have, we had used another, another investment bank about two years before who, you know, shotgun the entire world with our, you know, our, you know, as an anonymized data and Walmart happened to be one of them. Walmart said at the time, apparently, no, thanks. We never had contact with them, but then through this weird timing and the other, the other company kind of falling out, uh, they approached us. Uh, but we did, it wasn't really an auction, but I guess, I guess it was a process. And we were kind of um, equally between being funded or being acquired. And so we were fortunately acquired. Um, I, was still, I, was, I still practice, you know, I've practiced medicine my whole life. I just had this discussion the other day. I spent uh, the last, last week, I spent about 12 days in a row in, in South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, seeing patients in the emergency department there, as you can imagine. Those poor folks are really hit hard with COVID and with all the comorbidities, there are a lot of them getting pretty ill. Um, so I was out there for 12 days practicing. I, I can't imagine not practicing emergency medicine. I'll probably be like Pablo Picasso, who was, you know, the day before he died, was in his studio. Um, the hard part for me is to me knowing when to stop because emergency medicine is a little bit of a young person's game. And while I still consider myself a young person, God knows I'm not. So it's always finding this balance of, knowing when this, you know knowing when you, it's like seinfeld you know you want to go out nearly at the top uh instead of like um happy days when fonzie has to jump the shark to go out uh what if anything did you find the most part of the negotiations price term so it's funny with walmart they said you name the price we'll name the terms and i thought oh hell yeah but as it turns out the terms are probably more important to the price or at least they're as as important to the price now again to walmart's credit they were tough as hell, but they were very fair. And you could argue with them and they would relent on some of it. Um, but at the end of the day, they knew the terms they wanted and they probably had 75% uh, of them and they weren't unjust and they weren't terms that, that it was like Mick Jagger under, you know, you're under my thumb. Um, but, but that's, that's kind of how it shook out. Um, we've been approached by a company that's majority owned by PE. I've heard they're ruthless. Any wisdom to share here? Run away, run away. No. Um, have a great attorney, have a great deal attorney on your side. If you're the, if you're the CEO and, and founder and employee, have your own attorney outside of the company's attorney in, um, to, to, to negotiate on your behalf. Because now if you're, if you ever diverge, from the company, acquired or not, all of a sudden now you're going to be in a weird position. So if they're trying to hire you as well to run this entity or to run this division, get your own attorney and have them advocate for your position and have a just a hardcore severance agreement. Um, I fortunately did, and it wasn't because I was brilliant. It was because I was really lucky and just I don't even remember what I was thinking when I did this, but I think, and, I, and I'm an attorney, which is in, embarrassing that I didn't really think this way. Um, but as far as P goes, have your own attorney, have a great corporate attorney, and and don't settle. The money's money's cheap these days, and there'll be others out there if this one doesn't work out. So stick to your guns is my my advice. 
Um, when did you find a time to get your JD? Why did you pursue it? Um, I try to go back to school every 10 years. And now, now since I'm getting older, I've shortened it to like five years. So I got an MBA in 93, 95. And I started law school in 03 at ASU. And the reason I did this was, well, twofold. One, I, I, I really do love to learn because every time I, every time I learn something, I, I would say it's like putting on a new pair of glasses. And I all of a sudden see things that I never saw before. And every time I go, what the hell? How are you so stupid that you've missed this? It was staring you right in the face. And the reason I missed it is because I didn't have this new pair of glasses on that came with this education. So I, I've, how I got into ASU, God only knows. It's a great law school and I probably can never get in today. Um, but they let me in. And the funny story is I, about two months into it, the dean calls me into her office. Um, her name was Rebecca White, brilliant woman. Um, her affect was literally as flat as the wall behind me and totally deadpan she goes uh, and i you know i'm a little bit effusive and i'm like oh you know dean right thanks for letting me in you know i won't let you down i'll be a great supporter of the law school and totally deadpan she goes well we thought i'd be smart to have a physician here in case someone dies and she just stares at me and i kind of started laughing thinking like this was something i would say to be funny and she wasn't being funny at all i'm like okay i got i got let in the law i was let in the law school so i could resuscitate somebody so the good thing about emergency medicine is you can kind of pick your schedule. So I would work, I'd go to school during the days until about noon, two o'clock. And then I'd work in the ED at St. Joe's from, we had a three to three shift or a two to two shift. And sometimes you get out a little early at midnight. And then I'd work a lot on the weekends. Law school, I, I love law school actually. Um, and so I went summers as well. So I got out in two and a half years. And then I kind of regretted it because I remember walking across the stage thinking, gosh, so what am I going to do now? I really, really enjoy this. And you've ever heard the old saying, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. I'm better when I'm busy. I got more stuff done in law school than I did not in law school. So when I was in law school, I was managing and running this growth phase of next care and so, still practicing emergency medicine at St. Saint, at Saint Joe's. And again, it wasn't bad, although one time I, I did allegedly raised my hand, asked a question, and while the answer was being given to me, I fell asleep. And I got abused for that uh, by this professor. To, to this day, I still get abused by the professor for that. Um, anyway, so I pursued it to answer, finally answer the question. I pursued it because I thought at some time I'm going to be too old to practice emergency medicine. Wouldn't it be fun and worthwhile to defend physicians in front of the Arizona Medical Board, which I did for a while. So I, I I got out of law school, I took the bar, passed the bar again, I have no clue how that happened, and started working with defending these physicians in front of the uh, in front of the medical board. And what I realized, and I don't mean to be speak disparagingly about our medical board is it was tough. And there were some days when they, you know, they'd, they'd let somebody kind of skate through, did something kind of egregious. And other days they just hammer the crap out of somebody who was like kind of kind of did something mildly wrong or even questionably wrong. I'm like, yeah, this may not be for me. So, so I still teach and I still write um, and I still review contracts, but I don't, I, I don't do much in front. Of, I don't do anything in front of the medical board. All right. After inception of a viable idea, how did you protect patent your process? That's a great question. There wasn't anything that me MD had. So back in next care days, one thing I, so I went back and got the Six Sigma black belt as well at the College of Engineering at ASU, and I love process. Like, I'm the guy who goes, I like to go to the grocery store. I like to cook. So I love going to AJ's. And I make it this game to see how efficiently I can get through AJ's. And that's why I literally, my whole life is like this. What can I do to be more efficient? And the moment I wake up, the moment I go to bed, I loathe non-productive time. And so um, back in next care days, we had, had this kind of business process patent we'd pursued. I had read that Dell computer had a business process patent. And so I'm like, we have a total process in next care. And I have to say it rocked. I mean, we could see a ton of patients a day there very efficiently, very safely, and it, we crushed it. And so we tried to do a business process patent for that. Um, it got it got a little bit of traction, but nothing that was quote protectable, really protectable. For me, MD, we didn't really have we didn't really have any patentable solutions that we could uh, you know basically get IP on. Um, so we really didn't do it. Companies that we invest in now, and again, I know some of you are out there who, who who are in this world have great have done have done everything they need and have great and are very protectable patents. So me, not so much. I think I got everybody's questions.
You didn't get mine yet, John. Oh my gosh. All right. <laughs> if they're not in the chat, I get to ask them. Oh, okay. Go. Sorry. Damn it. <laughs> so, so first of all, John, thank you. This has been a, a tremendous, you know, look into the journey. And I can remember when you and I first met, which was at your hangar in 2011. Yep. And, um, you know, you talked to me about the vision and you stuck to it when things were not that easy and um, hopefully paid off well. So as we move towards this, we have so many entrepreneurs that are looking for money. And the question comes up very often, should I go for big money or should I bootstrap? And um, you gave examples of how me med me and D raised a reasonable amount of money, but your competitors raised, you know, multiples of in millions of that money. What's your perception of, you know, going for it, going big or going home as opposed to bootstrapping? I think if you've got a great enough idea and MVP, go big. Um, argue for your valuation. You know, now that I'm trying to sit in this venture capital side of the table, I'm like, you know, no, no, your valuation is much lower than you think it should be, um, which is the kind of, you know, this interplay that we'll, of course, have to have. And I, I would expect the opposite. However, sitting in in your shoes and my shoes still, um, I never did it right. The right way to do it is to get the MVP, get your market, iterate it to the point where like, oh, this is we've got something here and then go big. Because I'm t you guys know, if you if you spend so much of your time looking for money, it takes away it takes you away from the business because looking for money is nearly a full time job. And so, finding the right firms to partner with, finding the right VC partner who's truly entrepreneur supportive, and I think most VCs are. And I did not know this distinction between VC and PE, and my fault entirely that I didn't beam up to this because retrospectively. Like most things, it's relatively obvious. Um, but I would find the right VC partner who really can shepherd you along the way. As they say, everybody's money is green. It's the connections you'll make, the people you'll be introduced to, and the support you'll get that matter. So, um, John, you know, as an investor, right, the valuation is critically important, right? It, otherwise, the risk reward calculation doesn't work. Um, it's one thing to be looking at. A services company it's another to be looking at a med tech company and it's another thing to be looking at a biotech company that's going to have a very long tail so um you know as an investor and through your experience selling services companies you know how is that different well like for me md was you know really valued and sold on a multiple of ebitda me md was a multiple of revenue and at the time going through this, this was hard to wrap my head around. And the, and the answer is, you know, me and D had a recurring revenue stream. You know, we had a per member per month thing. So we didn't have to go out and find new customers. We did go out and find new customers, but our existing customers just kept back and paying every month. And that was really the difference in the way the valuation was approached. So if you have a company that has this built in platform that allows for recurring revenue, and, and now we're so used to this with the Facebooks and all those of the world that we pay monthly to subscribe to, well, not with Facebook, but you know where I'm going. Um, it makes sense to be based on revenue. Uh, the true services company where you're asking patients to come in the door and hopefully you'll get them back and customer retention is everything. Yeah, it's the, it's the multiple of EBITDA that's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be where it's at. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your question. No, I, I think that's very helpful. And um, I know that for many of the listeners on this call today, um, they are getting ready for investor season, right? We've been doing virtual investor conferences for the last two years, and now bio is coming up in San Diego in June. Arizona Bioscience Week will be coming up in September. And as a matter of fact, we sent out the email to all of our community just this week saying, don't forget it's time to apply. So as we look at um, you know, doing that, if we don't have, if, if the entrepreneur doesn't have a good idea of what their value is, how can they sell it to investors? Well, it'll be, it, it'll be, it'll be brutally obvious what your value, I just had a discussion the other day, somebody told me their, their valuation, and I thought, okay, this doesn't make sense to me. 
And I got, this, I got this kind of defensive, it wasn't defensive, I got this defense, like, here's why it makes sense. I said, okay, that's great. However, here's, here's how people are going to value your company. So I think if you do your research, and now it becomes relatively easy to do, if you do your research, you're going to have a sense. And believe me, we all overvalue our companies, and we should, and everybody expects us to say, you know, these are really conservative projections, blah, blah, blah and everybody rolls their eyes, and you kind of smile to yourself. But here's a company's valuation and then see what the market will bear and you know knock on wood hopefully you're right and the, one of the challenges is if it's overvalued you kind of end up can shooting yourself in the foot later on same if it's undervalued so with this competitive process i think the right value is ultimately ultimately discovered great so um you know, I've started my share of businesses. You've started your share of businesses. Um, some of the toughest conversations that you get with investors or advisors is when they tell you that your baby's ugly. Yes. How do you deal with that? So one of the things I've learned along the way is you, you have to have this weird combination of confidence and humility because if you're not confident, obviously no one's gonna no one's gonna buy in. No one's gonna say like I'm gonna follow this woman to the. I always say, call it you know charging the machine gun nest. You better be confident, or no one's gonna be. You're gonna be charging the machine gun nest, and no one's gonna be charging along with you. That's the confidence. The humility part is knowing that. And for me, this was always easy because I grew up as a total failure. So it was always knowing there's people who know a lot more than I do out there, and being open to their advice. And so. If you can dial down the ego and go into this with this open ar open arms and open eyes perspective of what do I have to learn here? Because you know, there's this quote, and I think it was by Edison. He goes, "I've never met a person so dumb I couldn't learn anything from them," and that is so true. I mean, I learned something from the people who are intoxicated screaming at me in the emergency department. Sometimes it's all something awfully funny, but I always try to learn something from them. And if you have this perspective with these potential investors, they may not be the fit for you but they probably have something worthwhile to tell you that if you can lower your ego and approach it with this air of humility, you're going to learn and better yourself from that. And so, you know, I've had babies called ugly most of my life, including me. Um, and so I, I, I sadly got used to it, but I think it's actually helped. It helped me tremendously, actually. Awesome. So you talk about the partnership that you've created now with Chris Yu to help the next level, uh, the next generation of entrepreneurs. Um, how are you and Chris different? Chris is much smarter than I am. He is much goes much. So I'm, I'm the guy who's an inch deep and a mile wide. And um, so I get to see a big, I get to see a broad, I can look at a broad swath of something and say, the, these this pair of things make sense to fit together. Chris being a PhD and a scientist and really a brilliant guy can get really granular and really deep. Um, so I think in that way, we're, we're very different. Um, and he has a tremendous, you know, he has a tremendous amount of integrity. And is it just, a, as you guys, I think most of you know him, is just a wonderful person. Terrific. So John, we're coming up on that, you know, last five minutes before I have to do the, the cleanup. So um, any closing thoughts you'd like to share? The, the, my, my only clothing, closing thought is that there is probably no better time in the history of mankind to do what you're doing, to be involved in health tech and to change the world. It wasn't in 2010, it wasn't in 1993, literally it's today. We are going to see changes like none other. I tell, I'm, I have a medical school, school student interview here in a few minutes, and I always tell them, close your eyes and imagine what the future medicine is going to be like in 20 years, because that's what you're going to need to think about as you're applying to residency and picking your specialty. So I'd say the same thing to you. Think of where medicine's headed, get there first. I know many of you are already on your way there. And because of what you're doing, the world will change. It will be a better place. and We'll take better care of patients. So thank you for doing that. That's it. That's awesome. Thank you, John. And um, I, I know everyone's virtually clapping in the background. Um, for those of you that would like to actually 
get to um, interact with John in person, he is going to be at the um, Arizona Biopreneurship Conference on March 25th. So I encourage you to um, go on the Easy Bio website or the Flynn Foundation website. The link was put in the chat and um, check it out. I'm going to be there. Natalie's going to be there and John's going to be there. So I encourage you to do that. Also, I would be in big trouble with Natalie if I didn't talk about our next program. So on March 15th, we are going to continue this process um, with a new two-part series called Charting Your Path. And the first one on the 15th is going to be all about navigating local grants. And um, the panel includes um, Jill Howard Allen from the Arizona Commerce Authority, Juliet Gomez from the Flynn Foundation, Natalie from AZ Bio, and of course Tom Schumann from CEI. So um, I encourage you to get that on your calendar if it's not there already. Lastly, Arizona Bioscience Week is coming back in person after two years. And so I need your help to join the team. If you're an investor, we need your help to get other investors signed up to go to White Hat on September 28th and 29th. If you're an entrepreneur, now is the time to start filling out those applications so that you can be in the first round of applications reviewed by the investor panels and get that early acceptance because the longer you're on the website, the more chance people have to see you. Um, so as we move forward, get engaged, plan your calendar, build your book of relationships because as John shared with you, um, it is a long journey and you need those relationships along the way. And don't forget to join us again next time for AZ Bio Peers. Thank you so much for joining us. Till then, bye-bye.